Good afternoon, everybody. Um, there are still people joining, but I'm going to make a start with the uh, the welcome and the introductions and the housekeeping as people continue to join us. So I appreciate you um, taking the time to join this um, this webinar, uh, which is hosted by the UK Reproducibility Network, but supported by a number of organisations that we work with, Armour, JISC, uh, the Data Archiving and Network Services and the UK Data Service. And what we'll be talking about today is open research and end-to-end -end ethics. And what we mean by that is the need to be considering how to embed open research practices into our workflows from the outset of a research project, rather than leaving it as something that needs to be considered at the end. And the extent to which we need to work with various stakeholders in that process to make sure that the um, the work that we do is fully integrated and um, takes into consideration all of the various um, different features of open research that uh, that we need to consider if we want to make sure that um, we can maximally and appropriately share our intermediate research outputs and make that research workflow as transparent as possible. And this is very relevant to the work of the UK Reproducibility Network because we have our um, open research program of activity that is funded by Research England and led by Neil Jacobs. But it's also relevant because we have a very large community of um, early career researchers in particular and grassroots researchers more generally and colleagues on the professional services side who are keen to uh, promote and support and embed open research practices, but maybe lack a degree of um, understanding of the various other stakeholders that they should be working with to achieve that most effectively. The um, uh, the housekeeping uh, notes are being put into the chat. So uh, Will, our administrator, is putting a few things in there around our code of conduct and the fact that this meeting is being recorded. So please do um, take a moment to look at those. We have uh, four speakers today, um, starting with myself in a few moments. And then we have uh, Louise Bezeidenhout, uh, who will be talking about building transparency into the research process. Tamsin Berland, who will be talking about joined up transparency and in particular choosing a repository and then Victoria Moody at the end talking about end-to-end -end ethics and each of those talks will be about 15 minutes long and we have five minutes at the end of each of those for two or three quick questions that are directly relevant to the content of those presentations and then at the end we have a panel discussion where you can ask us any questions that you might have about any of the topics that have been uh, raised and in particular questions that perhaps link across some of the presentations. If you'd like to ask a question, you can do so in one of two ways. Either raise your hand and, uh, and I will come to you and um, uh, bring you into that conversation. Or you can put your question into the chat and uh, I will read that question out. So whichever you feel more comfortable with, both of those options are available. So we will be starting in a moment with my um, opening presentation on what is open research and why does it matter? Then we'll be moving on to Louise. We'll have a short break at 10 to two, um, assuming we stick to time, which will allow us to stretch our legs and get a cup of tea because this is a reasonably long workshop. Then we'll have the next two talks by Tamsin and Victoria. Then we have another short break, um, again, assuming that we're running to time and the panel discussion is scheduled to start at 10 to three. And we have 40 minutes allocated to that with uh, the aim being to finish at half past three UK time. Um, and uh, I don't know where you're all joining from. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to have um, international guests on these uh, or attendees on these workshops. So wherever you're from, we welcome you. Um, but if people are happy, we're slightly ahead of time. I'm just checking my notes to make sure that I haven't missed anything, but I don't think I have. So I will uh, move to sharing my slides. And I'm just going to set the stage really by talking about what open research is and why it matters. And for many of you, this will be something that is... Um, a well-trodden path, if you like, and a familiar topic, but uh, but I don't think it hurts to bring ourselves back to why open research matters. And it's true that there are a number of reasons why we might want to um, encourage a culture of open research. And in fact, um, there are reasons to locate open research within part of a wider conversation around research culture. Some of the reasons for that are if you like, ethical or moral, that the um, outputs, including the intermediate outputs of publicly funded research or charitably funded research should be made available to as wide a community as possible. But there are other reasons that I think open research is important around the um, 
the quality of the research that we produce. So different people will bring different perspectives to uh, why open research matters. This is very much my own perspective, but um, it may come out in the conversations afterwards, the questions that are asked in the panel discussion, what some of those other reasons might be. And uh, it would be interesting to consider people's different takes on this. So as I mentioned a moment ago, you can think of open research as part of a wider conversation around research integrity and research culture. And as you'll be aware in the UK, certainly, but also internationally, there's a great deal happening in that space at the moment and a great deal of interest in what we can do to promote in, uh, research integrity and foster a positive research culture. This um, report that's a couple of years old now on research integrity, this landscape study that was conducted by Vitae in partnership with the UK Research Integrity Office um, and the UK Reducibility Network on behalf of UK Research and Innovation, uh, captured some of what the community feels are the issues around research integrity and a considerable part of that related to what we might think of as open research. Here at Bristol, we've done a piece of work thinking about how we can define research integrity. It's another one of those phrases that um, is, is, has the potential to be somewhat nebulous if we, don't, if we don't nail down what we mean by it. And we think that it's helpful to tease apart the research process itself, how we actually do research from the behaviors of individual researchers, what you might think of as professional behaviors. And there's also an aspect that's about managing risk, which, which is relevant when we start talking about, for example, sharing data and when it's appropriate to make data open as opposed to shared in a more restricted way. But the research process itself is an important part of what we would think of as factors contributing to research integrity. And all of those things sit within this um, wider conversation around research culture that's uh, worth bearing in mind throughout this. So open research is really just the process of making as much of that research process available for scrutiny as possible, sharing not just the eventual output of a research process, a journal article, a book, a monograph, whatever it might be, but also all of the intermediate research artifacts that um, uh, that contribute to that process. This figure talks about open science, but actually I think open research is a more useful and more inclusive phrase to use. And what we can make open or at least um, shared and shareable is anything that is part of that research process. So that can be the data broadly defined, anything that, uh, that can be digitized and that we use as part of that research process, uh, the code that we use, the methodology that we use, and we know about uh, open access publishing, for example, and open peer review. So this is a snapshot of some facets of what we might think of as open research, but essentially it is that process of making the research workflow transparent and making those intermediate research artifacts, the um, contributing parts to that research workflow available for scrutiny, available for reuse in, in a way that, as I'll talk about in a moment, hopefully serves to improve quality although there are other benefits associated with open research, such as the potential for reuse of elements of that research process. So why does that matter? So this is a study from my own discipline um, in psychology, where the researchers collected real data and showed that when um, participants were randomized to listen to When I'm 64 by the Beatles, they became younger. Not that they felt younger, but you turn back the arrow of time and they actually lose a a year of life, which is clearly a false finding, however much we'd like that to be true. And what it demonstrated at one level was simply that if you build enough flexibility into the design, conduct and analysis of your study, you can arrive at a small p-value statistical evidence for um, an effect, even though that is clearly false. But that to me wasn't the most important aspect of this study, because what they showed was that you can report that study, and here they just do it in the abstract or an abstract for that study. Uh, you can report that study in one of two ways. You can either give a full transparent account of everything that you did that lays bare all of that flexibility, and that abstract is shown in full here. And when you see all of that flexibility, it gives you a lens through which to interpret the result, and it would give you um, reason to be cautious about a particular finding. This finding is clearly false, but of course, structurally, this study is like any number of others that are published regularly. But they show that you could also, if you chose, report your study in a more redacted, curated way, and that's shown in bold here, embedded within this full abstract, where you only selectively report some of what you did 
in order to create the impression that you're finding is more compelling than it actually is. And this to me is part of the point about how open research and transparency more generally can contribute to research quality. Because if we stick with the um, conventional model of publishing, where we effectively have to trust the researchers to have reported everything as fully and completely as they can do, then we can never be certain which version of the abstract we're actually reading for any given study. Are we reading a full account of everything that was done or the full paper? Or are we reading a redacted curated version that has been effectively edited to create a more compelling narrative? And without transparency, we don't know which of those two versions we're reading. If there is transparency in the research process, then we can go and check whether everything that's reported in the final research output is a fair reflection of everything that uh, was part of the research process that led to that output. So it's that ability to scrutinize the workflow, scrutinize the process and understand um, how the eventual output came about that contributes to that um, quality control function that I believe open research can serve. Because without that transparency, all of these problematic behaviors that have been well documented over the last 10 or 20 years, captured in this nice cartoon by the blogger Neuroskeptic, can continue to um, propagate through the literature without us being able to actually identify when those things are and are not happening. So again, that transparency allows us to both identify when these things are happening, but also serves as a disincentive for these things to be done in the first place. And this is an important issue, this question of the extent to which the research that we generate is of the quality that we would want it to be, is an issue that has reached the highest levels in many countries in terms of funders, but also policymakers. For example, the UK Parliament's Science and Technology Committee um, recently held an inquiry into reproducibility and research integrity based on these concerns that many research findings are not of the quality that we would like them to be with a particular focus on, on STEM disciplines, but arguably the same principles in terms of the benefits of transparency apply much more widely. So I think the onus is on us to identify what those problems are, identify solutions and uh, develop approaches that are co-produced with the um, extended academic community, not just researchers, but professional services colleagues as well, so that we come up with a solution that is suitable for an academic environment rather than one that is imposed on us by policymakers, for example. But uh, but I think the uh, there is a very clear need to seriously address this issue. And for me, open research is an important part of that conversation. We made the analogy a few years ago uh, in the context of, again, scientific research, but I, I would argue that the, the principles of transparency apply much more broadly than that, um, where the argument was that what we need to do is something akin to what happened in the automobile industry in the 1970s, where the concept of quality control as embedded in a process was brought in to improve the quality of the outputs, but also less intuitively to improve the efficiency of the process. Because by ensuring that the end product of your process is high quality, you also um, don't need to expend resources on fixing problems that emerge later. And the analogy in the context of um, scientific research is that if we produce research findings to be fixed later, we actually advance knowledge more slowly than if we than if we ensure that those research outputs are of high quality to begin with. So even though we're putting some effort into that quality control function during the research process, actually that pays back and more than pays back over time through that more rapid advancement of knowledge. And you can see an example of what that looks like here. So in 2000, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute in the US required the registration of primary outcomes on clinicaltrials.gov for their grant funded activity. You can see year of publication of studies that they funded on the X axis and effect size on the Y axis. And that little flag shows the point at which they mandated um, the pre-registration of primary outcomes. Before then, you had no way of knowing whether what was reported in the paper was in fact the true primary outcome that was stated a priori, or a secondary outcome that was promoted at the point of writing the, um, the final research output, the journal article, on the basis of being a, an ostensibly more interesting finding. After 2000, you could check. You could go to clinicaltrials.gov and find out whether it, what was reported in the paper was in fact the primary outcome as originally stated. And you can see there's a dramatic shift in this pre-post analysis from most of the studies before 2000 
being positive, reporting a benefit of the intervention over the comparator, and some being neutral, shown in blue, showing no difference between the intervention and the comparator, to after 2000, most of the studies being neutral, a couple being positive, and one for the first time showing evidence of harm. So that transparency seems to have dramatically shifted the nature of the results that we're publishing. And on one level, that might be disappointing in the sense that there are fewer positive results being reported. But if those results that are being reported are more robust, more accurate, then ultimately that's going to mean that we um, advance knowledge more efficiently and more effectively. So what I've tried to show is that open research, in my view, has an important part to play in ensuring the quality of the research that we do. As I've said, there are many other benefits to open research and we can touch on those um, later. But then we need to think about how to do that and how to embed that into our practice. And these are some of the issues that we'll hear about in a moment. We need the infrastructure to be able to conduct open research practices. We need high quality repositories. And in particular, in my view, repositories that are, are curated where there is a data team that can check the quality of your deposits, ensure that you have the relevant approvals in place. Um, those may not always be available to you, but when they are, in my experience, they're hugely valuable. So data teams embedded in library surfaces are an important part of that wider conversation about infrastructure. We need training. Researchers need to understand how to engage in this in these processes. And we at the UK Reproducibility Network have been developing trainer trainer courses as a scalable solution to uh, project that training across a number of institutions. We need incentives to encourage people to adopt these practices. Um, at Bristol, for example, we've adopted open research in our pr uh, promotion criteria. And we need to ensure that the ways in which we adopt these practices are interoperable. In other words, the ways in which open research practices are realized in one institution and by one research group are broadly comparable to the ways in which they're realized in other institutions and other research groups. If people are trained in um, interoperable ways, then they can move more freely beyond between institutions, bring those open research practices with them and um, move seamlessly into a new institution, a new group. And the same applies to incentives. So we need a joined up approach if we're going to really maximize the value of open research and uh, minimize the, um, the friction associated with taking up these practices. And that's what we will talk about for the remainder of this workshop. Here are a few resources if anybody is interested. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen now and see if there are a couple of questions. And there's a question, would the UK benefit from a statement on open like that has come out of the WHOSTP? Um, so I think statements, high level statements are very important because they um, raise the profile of initiatives, efforts and they serve as something to bring the conversation back to if we feel that there isn't enough progress being made. But I think that there's a danger that if we just leave it at those statements, then not much action actually happens. So I think we need a kind of systems or joined up um, approach that also takes into account all of the energy at the grassroots that researchers themselves are bringing to this in terms of their desire to um, adopt open research practices. Many early career researchers in particular, in my experience, just see this as a natural way of working. Um, and are often frustrated when it's not supported by their PIs or by their institutions. So we need to have those different levels to it. We need to have the training in place in institutions. We need to have the incentives reflected in things like hiring and promotion criteria. I think the statements that can be put out are a great way of um, crystallizing some of those things, but it needs to be um, backed up by other initiatives that will drive real, um, real change. Um, Michael asks, uh, I'm really interested to hear you referencing high quality re repositories. I'm just curious to know what you mean by this. Do you regard institutional repositories as part of this? Subject specific repositories may be more meaningful. Um, we will be touching on this in, in one of the later talks and Tamsin in particular, I think will be, will be speaking to this. Um, there are many repositories out there um, and they're all good in different ways, I guess, but some are simply repositories where it's down to you to put your deposit together um, appropriately and then post it and then it's available on that repository. What we found is that we often miss things as we're putting our deposit together. And it's only because at Bristol, we have an institutional repository backed up by a data team that checks our deposits before they publish them. It's only through that process that we've identified some of the things that we've missed or they've identified some of the things that we've missed. So, um, 
I think there is a real value in, in putting proper infrastructure behind these repositories so that the deposits can be checked for quality to make sure that the relevant approvals are in place for sharing, that people haven't inadvertently retained a variable that could lead to re-identification of participants, for example. There are lots of different factors that we need to consider and, and research groups, researchers themselves may miss some of those things just because human error is going to be a feature of any uh, endeavor. So I think there is value in having those data teams supporting repositories, which is why I talk about institutional repositories with those data teams being particularly valuable. I think there are a number of um, subject specific repositories out there. And again, this is um, something that's very much uneven across disciplines. Some disciplines have uh, quite an established culture of data sharing, particularly in the biosciences. Other disciplines uh, are earlier on in that, um, in that journey, if you like. And where there is a subject specific repository that um, is part of what people routinely do, then that would be the natural place to, um, to deposit your data. So there's no single answer to that. I don't think there's a right repository for, um, for any given, well, th there's no single right repository that everyone should go to. Rather, what is appropriate for you will depend on the nature of the research that you're doing, the disciplinary norms within which you're working, what resources are available to you within your institution, and so on. And, and as I say, hopefully there will be more on that in later talks, and we can come back to that in the, um, in the panel discussion. Um, Grace asks, what in your experience has been the most effective way of encouraging uh, researchers to adopt open research practices? I think there are a couple of routes into that. One thing that I think is important is to be able to articulate the benefits to researchers themselves of working in this way. So for example, many of the things that uh, you need to do if you're going to share, for example, data and code, um, simply require you to work in a good way. In other words, to adopt just good working practices when it comes to curating your data and so on. Um, what I mean by that is that if you prepare your data for sharing, they need to be understandable to anyone. They need to have um, a data dictionary. The, the data file needs to be well labeled. There needs to be metadata to accompany the deposit. And all of those things mean that when you yourself go back to your data six months later, you can immediately make sense of it in a way that can be much more difficult if you haven't curated your data in that way. Or if you're running a research group and new researchers are being onboarded, they can get up to speed with previous studies much more quickly if all of that has been done. So all of these things that you have to do to be able to share data also mean that you can um, run your own research process more efficiently yourself. So I think articulating those benefits is part of it. Um, another part of it, I think, is not making people feel like they have to do everything at once. And um, Kirsty Whitaker at the Turing um, has said in the past, you know, just start somewhere, do whatever it is that seems easiest to you, whether it's posting a preprint or sharing your data or sharing your code, just start somewhere. Don't feel like you have to do the whole lot. Don't feel like you have to do it per um, perfectly. Just start the process of gradually building more and more transparency into how you work. And over time, you will get to the point where actually this is just a routine part of, of what you do. Um, Leslie asks about the train the trainer courses. So um, the idea behind a train the trainer course is that, uh, for example, representatives from a number of institutions could send a trainer to a central course, either virtually or in person. And those people could then develop content that they would deliver locally, but do so as part of that group that have come together to ensure that all of those individual workshops that are then delivered across different institutions, even if they differ slightly because they're being targeted for slightly different audiences, slightly different disciplines, all share some common features in terms of the underlying principles so that the training that is then delivered across those 20, let's say 20 institutions, um, is hopefully more interoperable than if those 20 institutions had constituted um, their own training individually. So it's about uh, ensuring a greater degree of interoperability, but also a degree of efficiency, because we can then um, bring all of those trainers up to speed uh, by supporting them centrally, but then scale that, um, that delivery of training much more effectively by having them go out and deliver that training um, within their own institutions. Um, we're getting lots more questions here. Let me see how we're doing for time. I'll try and cover a couple more, and then we're on scheduled still to for Louise to start talking at, uh, at half past, which is on the agenda. Um, and Will rightly says that if we don't get to all of these questions, we can pick them up under the um, panel discussion. Um, 
Peter talks about how research data are often provided to researchers under restrictive conditions. They can only be accessed via a safe haven, making it impossible for researchers to share. Have we got the balance right between preventing disclosure, breach of confidence and open research, or are we too risk adverse? I think that's a really interesting question. I think it's worth um, remembering that open data is not always the most appropriate way to, to go. And uh, we increasingly talk about fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, but that doesn't necessarily be, mean open. And, um, and we often talk about data being um, as open as possible, as closed as necessary, because there are cases where um, either because the appropriate approvals aren't in place or because um, there is a risk of re-identification, for example, cases where the, the data needs to be shared under more restrictive conditions. And some repositories allow for different levels of access to, uh, to reflect that. Um, in terms of have we got the balance right or are we too risk averse? I mean, I think you would get very different answers from very different people, but hopefully, again, some of that will come out in, um, in future conversations. Adam has very helpfully posted a link to the, uh, the White House statement that he referenced, which I think was, uh, was really quite a powerful statement and, um, and very high level, of course. If you haven't seen that, the link is in the chat for you to pick up on. Um, Miguel talks about registered reports. Um, I think we might come back to that in the panel discussion, uh, just conscious of time. Um, but that's obviously another part of open research and links to uh, more generally pre-registration of study protocols as part of how we can make our methodology um, transparent. So I think we've got through most of the questions. I'm going to put the two links at the end of my talk into the chat. But as I do that, I will now come back to Louise. Sorry, Louise, for... Um, getting you to turn your video on and then off earlier, but um, uh, I'll hand over to you. Thanks so much. No, it's absolutely fabulous to have all the questions in the chat. So um, no worries there. I'm showing my screen now. I hope that's coming through for everyone. Yes. Awesome. And okay. um, so, yeah, thanks uh, Marcus for the introduction and um, for the opportunity to be here. Um, my name is Louise. I'm a senior data expert at an organization called DUNCE, which is the data archiving and network services um, based in The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, we run the national uh, institutional uh, national repository for research data, and we also participate in a number of different uh, activities relating to the European Open Science Cloud um, training and um, embedding research data management in uh, Dutch uh, research institutions. Um, so Mark has been mentioned that I was going to be talking about transparency in research, but I've taken a bit of creative liberty and uh, changed my uh, title slightly. Um, so I want to be talking about the hidden ethical challenges of FAIR data. And uh, FAIR was obviously just brought up in response to the question about um, open and, and FAIR data. Uh, so I thought I would um, pick it up from there. And it's a nice way to, to segue from open data into FAIR data. I know that for many of you on the call, FAIR will be quite a, a familiar topic, but just in case there are people uh, in the audience who aren't as familiar with FAIR, I thought I'd start off with a brief overview of what FAIR is. So uh, FAIR, the, the FAIR data principles um, evolved from discussions had in 2014, and in 2016, there was a very influential paper published that really outlined uh, what uh, principles uh, would enable data to be considered FAIR. And FAIR, as you'll see from the slide, is, um, is an acronym. It stands for Findable, Accessible, Interoperable, and Reusable Data. And the FAIR data principles are a minimal set of community agreed guiding principles and practices that outline um, how to treat data. So uh, for the F in FAIR, uh, data needs to be findable. So metadata and data should be findable for both humans and computers. Uh, data needs to be accessible, so once found, users need to know how data can be accessed. It needs to be interoperable to enable data to um, work with applications or workflows for analysis, storage, and processing. And reusable in that the goal of FAIR, the real take-home message of, of FAIR data principles, is to optimize data reuse via comprehensive, well-described metadata. So the FAIR data principles have been extremely rapidly adopted by research communities and um, research guiding organizations. Um, it's been adopted uh, as, as, um, as, as core to um, data management by the EU and, and also in the UK. And it's also evolved beyond academia. So it's being taken up by pharmaceutical companies and other commercial companies. So it's really changing the way we understand data and changing the way 
we, um, we think about what constitutes uh, responsible research data management. So there is um, a lot of uh, support for FAIR, but it's also important to recognize that FAIR is not uh, the magic one that's going to uh, solve all data problems. And it's also important to recognize that FAIR and open, while they overlap as concepts, are actually different. Um, so we're looking at the slide, um, the, the, the image in the slide, you'll see that uh, understanding data can be done on many different levels. So initially we're thinking about managed data, so data that uh, can be reused by researchers within um, an organization. Um, by applying fair data principles, it becomes accessible to researchers outside a, a research group or outside an institution. Um, and then open data really sits on top of fair data, so ensuring that data are um, accessible without any sort of restrictions or limitations. So understanding um, managed data, fair data, and open data as overlapping but distinct concepts. Uh, so fair data is incredibly important for uh, improving research transparency because understandably um, data that can be um, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable um, allows people to go back and check uh, research findings and also potentially integrate them into their future research. So it really, um, to use a, a phrase, it, it oils the wheels of uh, research transparency and uh, research efficiency. However, FAIR is also recognized to be an incredibly important um, way of improving uh, economic responsibility and uh, returns on research. So a very interesting 2018 uh, report by the European Union drew attention to the cost of not having FAIR research data. And they outlined a number of different uh, aspects that, that were being impacted. Uh, time spent on research, the cost of storage, um, licensing costs, uh, the impact on research retractions, uh, the possibility of double funding because uh, there wasn't an, the, the, there's no scrutiny over um, what research is being done, um, how it can hamper interdisciplinarity because disciplines cannot reuse data and, and integrate data into their, their research projects, and also potential economic growth. Um, and the, the EU report estimated the cost of FAIR being around 10.2 billion euros, um, and actually that the... the um, the final total is a lot higher when considering the downstream impact of uh, not having FAIR data. So FAIR is being incredibly widely adopted and is becoming quite a buzzword when talking about data. Um, but I feel sometimes FAIR, the FAIR data principles are slightly misunderstood because the FAIR data principles are exactly what they say, um, a set of principles, not a set of actual implementable standards. And um, in order for FAIR to actually be useful for research communities, it requires a translation of the principles into um, defined and agreed sets of practices uh, by disciplinary community involvement and consensus. So these um, FAIR data practices um, can actually differ between communities depending on the types of data they use, um, the types of uh, practices that are embedded within the, the research traditions and uh, the preferences of the individual community. And these disciplinary communities have really embraced the challenge to adopt fair data standards um, that, that it not only embody the principles um, and the ethos of the principles, but also reflect their own requirements. However, um, even with the evolution of uh, the principles into disciplinary uh, practices, there are a number of challenges commonly associated with uh, FAIR that are, are quite widely discussed. And these uh, range uh, from uh, the fact that a lot of resources are needed, um, particularly to verify existing data, and the complexity of understanding the phrase as open and possible, as close as necessary, which Marcus um, brought up in his, his previous talk, the uh, challenges of dealing with unstructured legacy data, um, the, the problems of data silos where the repositories are not interoperable and um, the, the practices of depositing data are not, um, not clearly defined. Uh, the challenges of recovering historical data, uh, particularly when employees move on and they leave a set of flash drives or a, a written lab book um, that, that is only interpretable for them. Um, the challenges of ontology management, uh, needing uh, the need for um, defined ontologies to be able to tag data properly um, to enable the interoperability and reusability. And then also um, similar to the challenges around open research, um, the, the incredible 
need to get community buy-in and um, community support for cultural changes. And um, because while fair and open are um, increasingly being adopted and embraced by research communities, as uh, some research communities and some researchers are potentially a little bit more hesitant uh, towards changing uh, their well-defined practices. Um, however, uh, even after the standards are set, um, the Fed data landscape is uh, difficult to navigate. Um, in recent years, uh, we've seen the evolution of um, automated fair checker tools. So these are um, automated tools that you can run uh, a data set through that will give you an um, evaluation of how fair the data are. And these are incredibly important tools for advancing fair discussions. However, it's important to, um, to recognize that these fair checkers themselves um, are not always as simple as they would seem. Um, they're useful, but uh, due to conflicting, um, conflicting ways in which they interpret the principles and uh, weight the different um, practices embodied within the principles, uh, they can return different uh, responses. So there was a, a very interesting um, paper done by uh, Sun Imonet and Dumontier, apologies for messing those names up, uh, where they compared um, the responses from two automated FAIR evaluation tools, the Fuji tool um, that was developed during the FAIR's FAIR project and the FAIR evaluator. And um, these are screen grabs from the paper. Um, the, um, the image, the table image, shows how the two tools um, actually return different responses on um, different aspects of FAIR. And uh, the take home message from this paper was that these FAIR checkers um, return different scores due to different understandings of concepts, um, different depths of information extraction, and different implementation of the metrics. So while FAIR checker tools are a, a very useful thing, it's also important to recognize that they're not absolute and they're not necessarily uh, uh, reflecting an absolute standard for, for fairness in data. So fair data principles and the translation to practices are very powerful and um, are rapidly changing the research landscape. But it's also important to recognize that this landscape, um, while still evolving, has challenges to confront. And um, when talking about additional challenges of fair, the most common topics that come up are issues to do with implementation, issues to do with automation and issues to do with um, sensitive data and GDPR, which uh, came up in the previous talk as well. However, um, I'd like to take uh, the rest of my talk to, to really talk about some other challenges that I feel are really underexplored and under um, addressed when we start talking about the fair landscape and, um, and data sharing. Um, the first challenge that I'd like to address is the, um, well, it's my perspective, but um, a general uh, observation that the fair data principles are very data centric and not user centric. So they're focusing on getting the data out there rather than the user experience of um, reusing and responding to the data. Uh, the second challenge to, to note is that practices reflect frames of references. So uh, the fair data principles, when they're translated into practice, reflect the community that's really been involved in um, in, in discussing uh, what constitutes as acceptable practice. And the third challenge is um, the, the observation that there are increasingly blurred boundaries um, between research um, and, and non-research settings. Uh, so what I'd like to propose is that rethinking fair practices from a user perspective actually gives a very different interpretation of thinking about fairness and presents a number of additional challenges um, to researchers that I feel need to be properly taken up if we are going to really reach this, um, this, this ideal of uh, fair and open data and um, a tr truly uh, inclusive research, global research environment. So I'm just going to break down uh, these uh, challenges into um, slightly more manageable uh, um, topics. So the first topic um, that I'd like to talk about is um, issues of access. So we were already talking about um, uh, trusted digital repositories and the importance of uh, data curation. However, um, issues of access to these open or fair re uh, resources um, are actually not globally consistent. Uh, these are screen grabs from a paper that I wrote with um, Professor Hugh Shanahan, um, 
earlier in the year, where we were looking at um, the impact of uh, financial sanctions and infra infrastructural insufficiencies on um, access to open resources. So this study really came about by uh, a recognition that while the network of uh, research repositories around the world are growing rapidly, um, they are unevenly geographically distributed. Um, you'll see that the, the, re the repository landscape is dominated by five countries, um, potentially what we understand as the usual suspects. So United States, Germany, the UK, Canada, and, and France. Whereas um, if you look on the lower section of that graph, you'll see that, um, for example, African countries, there are a very low number of repositories, South Africa being the only one that actually has um, more than four repositories on the entire continent. And this uneven access to repositories um, creates a number of difficulties. Uh, the first is that um, uh, due to the complicated legislation surrounding financial sanctions, um, country uh, researchers in countries that um, that the the United States, for in, for in particular, hold sanctions against, are um, often block access from accessing these open resources. Uh, the second complication is that for researchers in um, in countries that have infrastructural, particularly ICT infrastructural in insufficiencies, um, access to the repositories is blocked by uh, timeouts. So understanding that uh, openness and, and, and fairness are not necessarily uh, consistently um, applied and understood around the world is a real challenge that I feel that we really need to start taking into uh, consideration when we decide how to manage our data, where to put our data and so forth. Uh, the second issue that I'd like to, um, to talk about is the role of commercial companies in the open and fair landscape. So this is a, a screen grab from um, the Center for Open Science, where they um, were outlining the different tools that are, are usable and recommended for um, reproducible, transparent and open research. And they name a number of different companies or organizations that they feel will facilitate um, researchers in embedding these open practices within their research. However, um, as you'll see from the red circles, a number of the companies that they are advocating for are um, actually commercial companies. And while there are, as you'll see in the yellow, while there are open source alternatives or open alternatives, and these are not necessarily as widely adopted or widely used uh, within research communities. And this, I feel, um, really should give us pause for thought, because while many of these companies are extremely important in uh, the research landscape and doing a very good job in facilitating open and fair research, um, they're not necessarily without problems. Their integration into the open science landscape is not necessarily without problems, um, because we need to recognize, recognize that these, these are commercial companies, and therefore they don't necessarily reflect the values and the priorities of the user community. And as we go forward into um, the, the future of open and fair research, um, we need to start holding these companies to account and start questioning um, whether they're actually doing uh, the jobs that, that we expect them to do. The third challenge that I'd like to address are um, the issue of multiple user communities. So um, fair and open data is increasingly uh, powerful for the research community. And also, as I mentioned before, uh, translating into government and uh, commercial organizations. However, there are a number of other organizations or other, other um, research communities that uh, would benefit from um, being able to access and reuse um, fair and open data, particularly nonprofit organizations or non-governmental organizations, uh, civil organizations, and then uh, the citizen science communities. Uh, all of these could benefit uh, from accessing the data, they could refine their, their practices, and they could potentially be contributing data. However, uh, the way that data are normally uh, curated, structured, and, um, and, and distributed uh, still continue to reflect the, um, the, the preferences and values of the academic community. And what we need to do if we're going to actually have um, an open and inclusive landscape is to think about how we can um, repackage data for these communities so they'll actually use it. And this obviously comes with uh, an obligation and a need to um, not only critically unpack these, but also train researchers in uh, these different practices. And um, in rethinking how to package data, we need to recognize 
that we can't be reliant on um, the same levels of science literacy, the familiarity with research data, research data management, or indeed access to um, information and com communication technologies and, and software. So the final uh, thing that I wanted to raise was um, the, the trend towards increased automate automation and tech technology dominance in research. So um, particularly for fair data discussions, um, the idea of machine interoperability and machine actionability is in incredibly important. And it's indeed, it's uh, a core part of how we understand fair data. However, there is a potential that this, this focus on uh, machine actionability can lead a bias towards um, high-tech research programs and data produced on um, uh, emerging technologies rather than heritage uh, research methods and, and heritage practices. And this um, can, can lead to a, a future in which we are unintentionally marginalizing low resourced uh, research communities who can't necessarily access or contribute data uh, due to lack of equipment. And these, um, the photos on the slide are two photos that I took uh, personally um, in my work. One is uh, an undergraduate teaching laboratory in uh, a university in Zimbabwe. And the second is an undergraduate teaching laboratory in, um, in Oxford, where I used to be based. And I think you'll be able to see from these uh, two contrasting pictures, um, the different levels of tech accessibility that um, communities, research communities around the world um, have uh, are 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 engaged with and and have access to and i think it's important always to pause and to start thinking about um different lived experiences of research around the world so this leads me to the the take-home message of my uh talk um which is really that fair research practices require self-awareness um, so thinking about fair data practices, not only from a data perspective, but also from a user perspective, throws up a number of challenges that I've just touched on. And I feel if we're going to be embodying um, inclusive research to the max, and we're going to be really taking transparency and reusability of data seriously, we need to push ourselves to ask a number of questions. The first is, um, who are we actually thinking about when we assume that data are fair enough? Um, are we thinking only from our own research perspective or are we trying to be inclusive and think about different communities who might have different preferences or, or, or requirements when it comes to accessing data? Uh, the second question is um, around community consensus. Um, we need to continually be questioning uh, whether community consensus is actually valid when it comes to these fair data practices if communities are not globally representative. Um, I, I myself belong to a number of international communities, and uh, while there is a lot of effort to get involvement from researchers in low and middle income countries, um, membership to these organizations uh, is sometimes much lower for uh, researchers coming from low resourced environments. And therefore, any discussions or any practices that are, are decided by these communities do not necessarily uh, reflect the, the lived experiences of uh, communities around the globe. And then finally, uh, we need to start questioning whether accessibility issues really um, consider non-academic users and, and how we can actually um, include these different data users into our discussions about fair and open data. It's important to recognize that these are practices that need to be embedded um, at the beginning and actually all the way through the research process because it is incredibly difficult to retroactively address these questions. Um, it's very expensive not only to verify data but to add these additional elements into uh, FAIR data is extremely challenging. Um, not addressing these questions will affect um, the, the levels of transparency in research and, and the levels of inclusivity in research. So it's important to recognize that while fair data principles are a powerful tool for improving transparency, their application, because they are still evolving, requires continuous scrutiny and improvement. And I do feel that there's a lot that can still be done uh, to improve the way, the way we understand fair data. The final slide that um, I want to leave you with is the uh, play on the term fair. So fairness from an ethical perspective um, differs from fairness from a data perspective. And fairness in research requires dialogue and deep understanding of the needs of researchers and non-researchers around the world. Uh, what we need to recognize is that the inherited ways of doing, uh, the ways that we learn from our peers, the way we learn from our, our mentors, are not always the best way of doing uh, 
not the best way of doing, not the best way of managing data, and not the best way of getting um, the open and inclusive research that we environment that we really want. Uh, what we need to do is we need to start liaising with experts in data management in order to challenge ourselves to find uh, better ways of doing things. Um, understanding this uh, really draws to the fore um, the incredibly important role that community man managers, library staff and research support staff have in, um, in, in opening up uh, research. These are individuals who have long-term experiences, not only with um, the evolution of data management, but also with the challenges of global partners because they often serve as uh, continuity links between different uh, projects and, and different uh, research communities around the globe. Uh, and because of this, they can shed key insights into the most useful systems and the most uh, inclusive systems. Um, the international research communities that I already mentioned um, are an incredibly important role, uh, play an incredibly important role in providing opportunities to understand the lived experiences of non-Western researchers and um, being part of these communities and using these communities to encourage um, inclus inclusion from low and middle income country researchers can be an incredibly important way of um, uh, opening up this landscape for the future. And finally, uh, thinking about research ethics, um, research ethics and uh, scrutiny of data management plans can highlight hidden challenges to fair and foreground the vulnerability and issues of marginalization that I feel uh, sometimes get uh, looked over when we're talking about fair and open data. So the take home message of this entire talk, I think is that just because data are fair um, from a, a data principle perspective doesn't necessarily mean it's fair from an ethical perspective. And there's a lot that we can do to, um, to, to really uh, reach this idea of ethical fairness in research in the future. So I would welcome any questions, but also if you'd like to reach out uh, to me at any point in the future, please feel free to either email me or follow me on Twitter. Thank, Thank you. you, Louise. That was great. And uh, very important to bring in that ethical dimension. Um, we are very slightly into our break now, so I want to make sure people have at least five minutes to stretch their legs. There's one question from Neil Jacobs in the chat when thinking about the role and risks that might come with embedding commercial tools into open and fair research practices. Do you think that the Dutch seven guiding principles for open research information can be a useful basis for decision making? So if you could perhaps quickly answer that question and then we'll go to the break. Um, I can very quickly answer that question with yes. I think it's an incredibly <laughs> useful tool. Um, I would encourage everyone to, um, to have a look at that. I think, you know, breaking it down into manageable steps, same as um, Marcus, you were talking about with openness and, you know, starting somewhere and starting the dialogue going and, and starting understanding small steps that you can make to make your data more fair is a, a really good way forward. So definitely thank you, Neil, for, for raising that. Thanks. And Neil very helpfully put the uh, the link in the chat. Um, if people do have more questions, then please, please put them into the chat. And maybe, Louise, you could just um, monitor the chat and answer the questions in there if, uh, if you're able to. Uh, we'll yeah. have a break now for five minutes rather than 10 minutes and come back at two o'clock UK time. So the top of the hour um, where we will um, hand over to Tamsin. But thank you all again. And um, I'll see you in five minutes. So welcome back, everybody, and um, apologies for the slightly shorter break, but we had some really good questions there, and uh, um, it was great to have that wider perspective on FAIR principles um, from Louise to build on those opening remarks around why open research matters. So now I'm going to hand over to uh, Tamsin Berland, and Tamsin is going to talk to us, is going to talk about end-to-end -end ethics. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Louise, and thank you, Tamsin. Um, I'm going to touch on today, I guess it's all about research culture, and it was excellent to see um, you all touch on the ways in which culture and people can affect this space. So my name is Victoria Moody. I'm um, Deputy Director and Co-Investigator of the UK Data Service. I'm also um, Director of Research and Innovation Sector Study at JISC. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the UK Data Service model and then start to try and, I guess, imagine and extrapolate out some of the uh, challenges and benefits that could be thought of in different um, ways, really touching on things like commercial um, actors in the space, the ways in which culture plays through the space too, the ways in which people and communities are also covered and not covered. So in this session, I'm going to cover a data infrastructure perspective on the benefits and realities of and potential opportunities for end-to-end -end ethics and one team approaches for trusted research. So the UK Data Service is a data infrastructure investment. It's funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. 
And it's a collaboration between the Universities of Essex, which acts as its um, principal investigator and runs the UK Data Archive, the Universities of Manchester, UCL, Southampton, Edinburgh, and also JISC. Um, and we look after particular products and services for the UK Data Service, lots of open data. So I'm just going to talk about the um, types of data that the UK Data Service has. It's got some very well invested um, public funded data collections that it's been making available um, over decades. And you can see some of them here. They're really kind of significant data. They help us understand who we are in the UK as a, as a society. Um, and also we offer census data UK wide. So we've got 1971 and now 2021 census aggregate data, boundary data, flow and microdata. And also in my team, we make available international macro data. So this is data from a range of international NGOs. And it covers things like um, economic indicators, science technology, um, also development, um, migration, UNESCO data, a range of different data. And also we make available um, international energy data via a commercial license to UK, HE, FE, and the Houses of Commons Lords, li and li Lords Libraries as part of the IEA's um, corporate social responsibility objectives. We do understand, however, that that commercial imperative is moving away and that the IEA is going to be making more of those data open. So this is a significant win that these data that are well invested and usually very expensive to access are going to be made much more available in the interests of better um, understanding of how um, energy prices, energy trade can affect um, economies and communities. So while I don't want to get into logo soup, and I'm not going to go through all of these, these are some of our suppliers, you can see that it's um, quite the collection, and it does span from the very local, we make available census output area data, right up to the international dimension. So just talking about the end-to-end -end approach. So in terms of the UK data service, we are a close coupled access and analysis model for increased research security, integrity and efficiency. And it was interesting that Tamsin mentioned um, the report around um, trusted research environments. The UK data service is quite an early one. We don't share data, we share access. Um, we make sure that, that, that the data aren't taken out of our environment if they're particularly sensitive. And I think Peter made a question in the comments about um, whether there was an over-reliance on some fairly kind of stringent access models. And I think from our perspective, we have to maintain that integrity and trust for both providers and for the people who contribute their data, the individual subjects who contribute their data into these environments, that they are going to be managed in a way that they can expect. And while I think things are changing and there are new, new approaches coming through and the Administrative Data Research UK um, and the Health Data Research UK teams are really looking at how this can be done more effectively and the Gold Acre Review will help some of that. But there are um, requirements and stringencies applied through a range of different routes that we have to take account of. So we're a data archive and a catalogue, so the data are archived. They're also available through a catalogue, which we continually iterate and try to make as searchable and as user-friendly as we can. And we know that that's not an easy um, task when we've got such, um, I guess, dimensionally um, complicated data that we make available. We are discipline aligned, so we do focus on the social and economic sciences, although by no means are we restrictive or prescriptive over, prescriptive over what that might mean. And you will see as, as the talk proceeds, just the ways in which that, um, I guess that discipline can contribute to a range of different other cross-disciplinary research projects. So we offer open safeguarded, which is an interesting term to secure data workflows. So we have a secure lab, but the majority of our data are open. We have vast swathes of open data and we don't actually um, take only secure data. We want to really support research where it needs to find the data it needs and not necessarily have all data loaded at the secure data workflow end, because actually it really does have to be a kind of test of whether that is the necessary route for research. We have a persistent identifiers over our data collections. We have done for some time. And these are versioned as well for some of the data like the international macro data, where those data do actually change and we do have to be able to refer back to versions for reproducibility. We offer preservation. So we absolutely preserve according to best practice so that these data are available for the long term and they go back to quite significantly early in the data um, availability spectrum. So we have some from very early centuries as well. We offer support and training, and this is key. We, we support and train from um, 
I guess, interested publics who are interested in things like family history, right through to um, our significant innovation in computational social science training, which is really very popular indeed as computational methods grow and particularly cross-disciplinary research. Impact and engagement is key to what we do. And for me, having previously been director of impact at the service, it's really one of the most important areas of our work. In terms of technology, um, we've been very traditionally on premises because of the um, perceptions around security and integrity. But actually, we I will talk about this a little, a little later. We know that we can't actually stop moving towards a cloud environment because it really is the ways in which to optimize um, technically um, our availability to researchers who want to use quite significantly advanced methods. And also policymakers who really do expect that level of security, but also that le level of um, flexibility in the ways in which they um, analyze the data. Length of service is key. I mean, I think one of the things to really note is that the UK data service has been a witness to society in the UK and internationally for 50 years. It's seen some big legislative changes that affect, have affected all our lives. And I think the data and the collection do reflect that. So in terms of that model, here are ways in which we actually secure and verify and testify to our integrity and our security. I'm not going to go through all of them, but we are ISO 27001 certificated. We operate the Open Archives Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting, and Louise was talking about metadata and how important it was. And one of the ways in which we see of advancing that approach is that our data contain a lot of identity metadata, and we're looking at doing some non-disclosive um, machine learning experiments to really understand how the methodology of the different data collections when linked express different identities and the ways in which they might be compared in a research project. So there's some quite advanced methods that we're trying ourselves in terms of this space. So the Digital Economy Act, the UK Data Archive, which contains secure data as an accredited processor. And so this is around that really very clear route to be able to access um, data, which may in fact be potentially disclosive. And so this is um, government data assets provided by the Office for National Statistics. So we operate under the five safe. So this ensures that those data are well managed, well accessed, well used, and are in the public good. It's quite an expensive process, but it really does ensure that these data are available to research. And back to that longitudinal focus, that long service focus can really understand how lives have changed, how people's lives and pressures um, are changing, particularly now, I guess, in the political and economic situation. So just a few things to think about. Dimensionally ethical. We think we offer comprehensive trust-based standards, and I think in the way in which we do um, consider these areas, we try to um, implement that trust-based approach right across the infrastructure. Our longitudinal focus offers an inherent stability, enabling that longitudinal research. We also have, because we're quite established, the capacity to mobilize fast and negotiate access to data that's really imperative to research. We're methods advancing in terms of that rigor, curation and onto training and usage. And I'm sorry, there's a typo there. And our interoperability focus means that we can link up with archives across the world. So long-standing innovation is something that we really do look at. So datum level access for data linkage, on the fly statistical disclosure control so that research can, researchers can actually check if those data when linked are going to be disclosive, and then there'll be a barrier to further access or there'll be a, a go live to be able to access those, access those data. We do work internationally, so we work closely with EOS, IDAN, CoData, a range of other partners who are doing excellent work in bringing forward standards. And of course, crisis research. I'll show you in a minute a slide where we've just brought in a whole load of new data relating to the pandemic. So we are a locus for those new data to add to the collection to do to, I guess, demonstrate that witness to society. And then one of the things that we really are focused on, and I think this has come up in terms of the technology discussion, is future migration. The data will always land as expected, given that we started with tape. And I know a number of other data infrastructures do have to use tape because of the sheer volume of the data that they hold, for example, the environmental data service run by NERC. So our data will always land as expected, we'll always be able to future migrate into new technologies. And then the R&D over the years, so there's plenty of ways in which we've explored code libraries and we're looking at machine learning now. So I'm not going to run through these, but these are some of the new data that we've been able to um, make available um, in response to COVID. And in terms of the impact, one of the things that we have found is that 2011 census data via Google Scholar has showed the need for population level UK data 
um, for environmental and epidemiological research. It became very highly used in the last few years when actually normally we find that census data that's 10 years plus previous aren't that well used except in historical research. And of course, impact. This is really what it's all about, impact and skills. So here are some examples of the impact and the developments that have been, um, I, I guess, relied on the data that the UK Data Service makes available from multiple sources. I'll just pick out two. So um, the Lancet countdown. So this relies on lots of our international macro data and particularly the international energy data to really make the case. It's a longitudinal study um, for climate change as a public health emergency ever more pressing. And then the Equality and Human Rights Commission's periodic report is Britain Fairer. This uses tens of data from our collection across the um, protected characteristics in the Equality um, Act to really understand whether people's lives are changing as a result of um, interventions in policy. And these data really do enable the EHRC to put forward um, the ways in which equality is, is, is improving or actually not. You'll see that the Social Metrics Commission report there and also Crisis Homelessness Monitor, which is using um, a range of the data from the UK Data Service. However, moving with user needs, um, there are some issues, I think, some opportunities. You know, it's vertically, vertically integrated infrastructure. It can be relied upon. It offers stability, funding to funding. But actually, the components can become interdependent. It can impact growth or sharing the wider benefit. And I think some of these cultural issues are key here, raised by Louise and also in Peter's question. A benefit is a clear data typology model offers researchers a clear model for access, but also what does it do for new data paradigms, new asset, new object paradigms that Tanzin was talking about. It runs lean and solo, of course. We're not very um, expensive to run, even though we're quite big and we do a lot. But actually, this designs in technical conservatism and a need to preserve skills at a certain point of development. So we struggle to um, adapt to new requirements for technical skills. Our collaboration potential is diminished, but technology evolves at an increasing pace. So I'm just quickly going to touch on some um, other programs that we're working on. I've got the UK Data Service Census Data Portal there. And what this means is that we're trying to migrate our census data through new portals. And they change with ever, ever increasing urgency. So we have some that go back sort of 30 years, but also trying to migrate to new access models just to bring forward that technological advance into the UK Data Service. In terms of JISC, and I think this really does touch on what Louise was talking about, JISC is the UK's um, research and education network. It's one of a range of global peers, and we work internationally with our peers, with NREMs across the world, to really advance the ways in which communities can access and um, cutting edge technology or the technology they need within the resources they have. And I think in terms of that cultural piece, we had a really interesting meeting with the um, New Zealand NREM and also the equivalent of Bayes. And they were talking about how, um, for example, Maori cultures are fundamentally excluded from the research infrastructure system except as subjects. And I think that's something to really think about when we think about how some of these infrastructures really do set out a fairly privileged um, dimension. So within the UK data service, I think that's where we're trying to understand the ways in which identity can play out. In terms of the GISC focus on technology, we're moving towards a new approach within our research and innovation sector strategy. What we want to do is really support research teams with the technology, they, technology infrastructure they need. And what we're looking to do is accelerate that shift to flexible, sustainable and cost-effective research tools. However, this is, um, I guess, something we really are very careful about. Technology advances at pace and scale. And one thing we found from a recent um, cons um, consultation we did with a big high-performance computing infrastructure is that technologies previously not available to many research collaborations will increasingly become more accessible. And that we are closing the gap between network cybersecurity access management and open research outputs right through the research endeavor. We see increasing commonality in research process and we see a range of exemplars. And what we want to do is ensure that JISC is actually able to support that change in the technology space to support a one team culture. One of the areas that we're really interested in looking at is how the um, outputs from research assets, research infrastructure assets play into the space. How can they be expressed through things like persistent identifiers, but also how do they support communities? What are the investment decisions being made? 
what are the ways in which these need decommissioning to respond to climate change and the ways in which leveling up dare I say is going to need to see communities invested with skills and high um, high capacity um, high specification infrastructure so we've brought together a, a stakeholder group from regional consortia, UKRI, research councils and researchers to really understand this issue. What can be the recommendations? What are the state of the art and the opportunities here? And how might these play out through the um, infrastructure system in future? So we know that these new approaches are moving into things like digital twins, remote labs, HPC, edge computing. Um, we know, therefore, and I think Tam's in touch to on, on this is that research assets of such diversity and complexity are emerging, which our sector may not yet be optimized to capitalize upon, oversee, or reproduce. We know that multidisciplinary research increasingly requires that creation and access to linked research assets. So something a little bit akin to the Goldacre report, but there is a concomitant risk of disclosure of personally, commercially, or otherwise sensitive data. Use of digital technology for inc these increasingly complex problems will need new approaches to and skills in asset governance, management preservation, and also what to keep and how. So how will we know what to keep? Well, we need to keep everything. How will we manage that environmentally, the cost, the resource, the technology? So I guess really what we're looking at is really, I guess what Marcus was talking about, extending, federate, federating, capitalising on established approaches across domains, mitigating against the potential for new technical infrastructure, duplication or proliferation, and the development of modular approaches um, to governance, management and support, making this an interconnected one team approach, data infrastructure, digital infrastructure, asset infrastructure, taking account of disciplinary, disciplinary distinctiveness where necessary. And this has significant potential. And at GISC, with our project focused on research software, we know that modular approaches must be developed and applied as technology agnostic towards a range of infrastructure technology settings because technology is evolving at pace. And we're in conversation with UKRI about some pilots and some blueprints. And what we want to do is really test some of these theories out to really look at what those um, challenges are for policy, for governance and for management, and also for culture to be inclusive. I've got a couple of examples here of how things like digital twins and cyber physical infrastructures are going to start, I guess, merging much more. We see themed mission um, research evolving in many places, really kind of a collaborative effort between local government, public sector bodies, research teams, commercial sector players. And we see this as not stopping. Um, we see this as extending far, far more into our lives than previously, um, and um, I guess, I guess as assumed would. In that terms of that, what we want to do is advance our expertise in supporting that sector coherence from our work in open access and licensing support. We've talked a little bit about working with commercial providers and Neil, thank you for putting in those principles. This is really where we're thinking. We know that infrastructure fixity in terms of data infrastructure, digital infrastructure research, asset management pra um, practice research, that fixity over the long term is no longer a realistic aim. We want to collaborate to bring that research infrastructure together with reduced friction, avoid technical debt, but actually we want to bring standards forward for working with commercial providers. So including research integrity and trust, expectations, for example, for no vendor lock-in, no vendor ownership, time and space to future migrate, cookie and algorithm transparency, and of course, environmental management, which is a key and growing issue, especially around the high performance area. We want to reduce time to science and time to impact and really convene guidance and case studies, good and excellent. So we want to be even more dimensionally ethical. Um, thank you for your time today. Um, it's been really great to present this to you. If you want to contact me and get in touch about this, please do my email is here and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thanks, Victoria. I'll just see if there are uh, any questions. There was a good um, question raised by Joseph about um, the exploitation of objects that have been deposited in open repositories. Uh, Tamsin and Louise have responded to that and picked up on the need for open data licenses. Um, and the issue of licenses is quite an interesting one. I think you've um, really laid out just how complex the landscape is and how many different elements there are that need to be joined up if we are going to have this this sort of end-to-end -end and one team approach embedded. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat for you, uh, one from Neil, one from Dan. Um, I'll come to the first one first, and then we'll maybe go into the break and you can perhaps answer the second one uh, 
in the chat. Neil's question is, um, your talk highlighted perhaps mainly the large data sets that are deliberately collected to be reference resources. Uh, perhaps you can comment a little more on how the data archive curates and makes useful the smaller and diverse data sets that arise from discrete research projects where the main focus of the project is not data sharing. And I think that's one of the challenges because you have these very large um, uh, data sets that are routinely shared and that's built into their conception almost. But then you have lots of researchers collecting data who want to also work in this way. How can we bring those two things together? Yeah, so I think the UK Data Archive has had a long-standing focus on this. The ESRC, which funds us, um, actually um, provides for um, research that's funded by the ESRC that produces data to be archived in the UK Data Archive. So we have this long tail of really excellent and really, I guess, very diverse research and data that has been collected by researchers over the years. It's in our reshare repository. So do please search reshare on the UK Data Service website and you'll see some absolutely fascinating um, research data that have been curated for the long term there is a lot of it and you can get lost in there but yeah please do go over and have a look thanks Neil I forgot to mention that but yeah it's a really important um, part of the way the service supports researchers with their own data to be made available for posterity Dan has a question about the um, uh, the development of modular approaches and um, whether there are any end-to-end -end ethics and governance frameworks that institutions could use if you could perhaps comment on that in the chat, because I'm just conscious that people might need another leg stretch before we come to the panel discussion and we can perhaps pick up on some of these themes there. So um, we'll have a short break now and we'll come back in seven minutes at uh, 10 minutes to three UK time. So 10 minutes to the top of the hour if you're in a different time zone. And um, uh, let's carry on the conversation in the chat and I'll see you all again in seven minutes. So welcome back, everybody. Um, I'll ask my fellow panelists to turn their videos on, but I am conscious that Louise is uh, is traveling, so probably won't turn her video on, but she should hopefully still be able to answer questions either um, directly or in the chat. Uh, there have been lots of questions in the chat already that have already been answered. And I just want to pick up on one of those questions that was um, uh, in response to uh, a previous question, which was around, the need to um, develop a sort of joined up approach to this that brings together researchers, ethics and governance teams, library and data teams, and so on. Um, Kirsty Merritt made the point that getting, for example, the message across to ethics committees so that they don't pass content that then will eventually end up being difficult to share can be a challenge. And that I think highlights the need for this kind of joined up approach that, uh, that we've been talking about, the fact that if you're collecting your own data, for example, on the smaller scale, perhaps that uh, Neil was talking about in his question, you need to make sure that you're consenting participants in your research for that kind of research to um, allow for subsequent sharing and ethics committees play a part in making sure that the, the wording is appropriate there so that when it gets to the point where you want to share it on your repository, for example, um, you don't end up in a situation where you find that you're not able to share the data as openly as you would have liked to because you haven't obtained the necessary consent for that, which goes back to uh, an issue that Tamsin was touching on, which is that need to, from the outset, have one eye on where you eventually want your uh, research objects to be ending up. So we have about half an hour, 40 minutes now to have a more general um, discussion about any of the issues that we've touched on. As before, please do um, put your hand up if you want to come in and ask your question. And in this panel discussion, it might be nice if people are comfortable doing so, for people to actually um, ask their questions, turn their video on and uh, and speak to the panel directly. But equally, if you want to put your questions into the chat, you can um, continue to do so. Um, Kirsty makes the point in the chat that they're in the process of training ethics committees in the finer points of data sharing wording. And that's uh, an interesting point that we might want to come back to. But Joseph, I can see you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just I, I wanted to try to re-ask my same question because I feel like I'm not quite clear what the answer should be really, um, but maybe to put it another way is, uh, you know, when, we, when we're talking about open research, we're often talking about contributing. I think you mentioned in, in your talk about, you know, what can we do to, to help individual researchers realize that, hey, it's not too much more difficult for them and they might actually see some benefits from putting their, their materials in a preprint archive or whatever and making them available. And I think that that's, that's great and we should be, definitely doing that and many people haven't seen those benefits and their real benefits and all that's currently being left on the table but uh there are a lot of people who are making stuff available uh you know github was mentioned and that, that's where i tag my 
thing on thinking, you know, once you put something on GitHub, then suddenly um, Microsoft, I guess, owns GitHub and therefore open AI has access to all of that data. Well, as does everyone else, right? But open AI and some of the other big players are much more ready to exploit that and make the next generation of technology off the back of open data. And people have been contributing to GitHub or some of these other places for quite a long time now. They might, might not have thought, oh, wow, I will be contributing to the next generation of AI that will make my job go away or something like that. I don't know if that's really what we can expect from GitHub or Copilot or whatever now. But I, I think that that answer is that, uh, yeah, Tamsin said licensing would be good. Um, but maybe just another way to put it is, is going back to that case of the individual researcher, um, what might be, what might be, um, whether it's a license or some other promise uh, or some other um, mechanism to say, hey, by contributing to this, you're gonna get a stake in the eventual uh, large scale exploitation of this data. Uh, I, 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 yeah, it could be a license maybe, but that kind of license doesn't seem to exist yet. Um, so I, I was wondering if, if anyone has been working on this because just, you know, for full disclosure, I'm, I'm really interested in the large scale exploitation of open knowledge resources. Um, and, and that does seem to be a big added value from open stuff. Uh, and yet who is, who benefits uh, Kibono? I don't know. Yeah, so I just thought I'd ask the same question again, verbally, basically. For further I discussion. think that's a really good topic to kick this off with. I mean, from my point of view, you never really know how your data are going to be used. And our experience has been that um, actually many of the data deposits that we've created in our research group have ended up being used in ways that we could never have imagined by schools, for example, for educational purposes. Whole methodologies have developed around summary data from genome-wide association studies. So there are definite scholarly benefits, public engagement benefits, societal benefits to data sharing. But then there are also commercial actors that may want to exploit these data resources. And the question to some extent, I guess, is how much should we allow that to hold us back? To what extent should we feel like we should retain ownership of how data are used? These are kind of live conversations that extend also to whether the originators of data deposits should be authors on any other subsequent scholarly works that arise from those uh, deposits, for example. And, and different people will have different views on that. Um, I see, Victoria, you have your hand up, so I'll invite you in. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marcus, and thanks, Joseph. I mean, I've got very specific views on this. I've worked in open data for a number of years, and I've worked at, at the coalface open data in metropolitan areas and really making it available. And what we saw was the value in commercial engagement with our data products. They weren't disclosive, linked, they weren't disclosive, but there could be some economic benefit or impact from the use of these data. It can move us forward. So I've never had a problem with this at all. And I think actually it's one of the things that, as Marcus says, unintended and unexpected uses are always of benefit. And actually, if there's no harm from the use of the data, they're not kind of linked with other data, then then there's a problem. I think that's a legal problem already covered. So I've got a very, very clear view on this. Um, and I think, yeah, just use the data. I mean, I think we need we need to acknowledge that people will have different views. But then again, this is part of the point of why you need to be considering these things up front. If you might not be comfortable with your data being used in a certain way, then perhaps you shouldn't be making it open. Because I, I don't think you can have it both ways. Once you've made it open, then it's open and other people can use it as they see fit. If you would have concerns about that, either specific concerns or un, you know non-specific concerns because you don't know how they might be used, then maybe from the outset of your project, you set it up so that you um, make your data fair, but not necessarily open, which goes back to the you know different levels of access that, that some repositories support. Um, but I think that's the point. If you've made the decision to make your data open, then you lose control over how it's used. Uh, I think this also touches on this kind of perennial tension in academia, which is who actually owns our data. We like as originators of data resources to think that we, to some extent, have ownership of them. But of course, um, the funders fund the generation of those uh, data resources. Our institutions pay our salaries that uh, allow us to generate those data resources. So the, the question of who exactly has ownership of them is, is a slightly complicated one that touches on the culture that we have in academia. Um, but um, Grace has a comment in the 
chat i'm just seeing if any of my other colleagues want to come in on that and and if you if anyone else has a view on any of these questions don't feel like it should only be the panel that is uh, is chipping in here um so grace's uh question in the chat is with regards to ethics of data sharing our ethics committees often highlight risk of data being used unethically by others once it's shared and conversely of our researchers being able to un uh, to verify whether data sourced from a repository was collected ethically before we reuse it uh, to what extent do you think institutions should be responsible for checking the ethics of open research and what can we do to ensure that ethics is maintained throughout uh, open research practices so um i will uh, allow my colleagues to think about whether or not they want to come in on that uh, certainly i know from my experience this again comes back to making sure that when you share data you share data well for example the metadata can include a statement where it's relevant as to uh, the ethics approval that was um, obtained for that particular study which committee granted it what the reference was so that you could check back um, to verify that the data were collected within an appropriate ethical framework if you're concerned about data being used unethically for example because you, it's um, it's sensitive data or um, from a sensitive population again you can make data fair without necessarily making it open so I think these are um, to some extent solvable um, problems but again they need to be thought about um up front and, and victoria i'll come back to you again thanks marcus i mean i think for me provenance is critical um absolutely metadata provenance the full range of um sources absolutely critical there can be hidden risks and i think ethics committees should have um, a role in making sure that those considerations are met um it's part of trusted research it absolutely is part of research integrity and I would say that that's another example. You know, I, I said that date that your metadata for a deposit should include reference to the ethics committee that approved the um, the collection of those data where that's appropriate. But of course, that's one of the reasons why it's helpful to have a data team checking a deposit before it's published to make sure that all of that information is in there. So again, that's that joined up approach that includes the researchers, the ethics uh, committee, the data team, and so on. But that's not always available to people. So we need to recognise that. Um, some researchers will be in a fortunate position to have access to that um, suite of resources and um, other contributions, but not everyone will. Um, Kirsty makes the point in the chat, we've dealt with some complex uh, projects which are impossible to fully de-identify by nature. Um, here, data collection design becomes very important. Then you can write consent to group some parts of a project as restricted and other parts as open. So you can tease apart elements. Again, that granular approach to research objects can be quite helpful. Um, there's a question here that Tamsin, you might um, have a view on. Instead of GitHub, what would be um, a good alternative to share software objects? So this is coming back to, you know, which repositories we should be looking at. And maybe also this question of whether we should be focusing on um, for-profit providers, non-profit providers, institutional providers. What are the options? Sure. I, I have to say now that I am not an expert on sharing so software. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but... Um, I think, I mean, I, I've, I've seen archived software in, in institutional repositories and and elsewhere. So I, 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 I'm, I don't feel um, sort of qualified to sort of recommend a, recommend a, a, an appropriate repository for, for software. The, the point was really that I think GitHub, you would, you, you can version the software, but there, there's always it's always evolving um, if if other people get involved. So very happy to to take suggestions from from other people here about a good place to archive software. And of course, it, it, that's a sort of how long is a piece of string question in the sense that software can mean very different things in terms of level of complexity and size and so on, which might have an impact on where you're able to um, to deposit it. There's a good question from Brenda. Our ethics committee skills to sign off um, the data management needs of complex research. And I think, yeah, particularly, presumably in the context of the issues we've been talking about, about around sharing research objects and uh, making sure that that's done in an appropriate way, I would suggest, and again, I'll see if any of my colleagues on the panel have a view on this, but I would suggest that the answer is probably some are, some aren't, and generally there's a need for more training in this kind of space. Um, and there's a linked question from Neil, which is, are or should ethics applications and approvals be open and preserved as a fully linked part of the research question? 
Uh, so, Victoria, you've got your hand up. Do you want to answer one or both of those questions? I, I completely agree with Neil. I mean, I think there's an ethical review part of every um, research project. So I think it has to include the, the statement of data collection and usage provenance. Um, and I think it's critical. I've seen examples, which I won't go into the detail of, where there's, there has been an ethical committee that's an ethics committee that has hasn't had full um, access to the facts, and there was some sense of this data was so critical to the research project that it needed to be utilised. And actually, it's always a, a subjective judgment call to an extent, but there has to be every um, I guess available resource to be able to give the ethics committee satisfaction that this has been undertaken in a way that would meet that approval process. I mean, in terms of, Kirsty made the point earlier that they're doing, in Bristol, uh, the data team is doing some training effectively with the um, with the ethics teams. And again, that um, highlights the need for these different elements of the research process, these different functions uh, to be joined up. Um, and um, I might come to Kirsty in a moment to just elaborate on that. In terms of Neil's point, we had a question right at the beginning about registered reports, which is a publication format whereby the study protocol is reviewed effectively before any data have been collected and then the journal offers in principle acceptance to publish the results of that study once complete irrespective of the eventual outcomes and that's meant to protect against various forms of, uh, of bias including publication bias but that's part of a wider landscape that include pre-registration of study protocols and I think Neil's point in part is that much of what we um, are trying to achieve is actually captured by the uh, what you submit to an ethics committee in terms of the um, what you're planning to do as part of your research, where that does go to an ethics committee, and that provides a mechanism by which that part of the research process and effectively that that research object can also be shared in some way. That's not yet routinely done. I'm not aware of any ethics committee that does that. Although I'm, I'd be very happy to hear from anyone who knows of an example of that. But in principle, that could be done. I know that there are concerns around not wanting to mandate sharing of study protocols. But of course, these things can be embargoed. They don't need to be released straight away when there might be um, sensitive information there or sensitive IP, for example. Uh, but that's something that, um, that we may want to come back to. So I'll, I'll just let my panel, my colleagues on the panel think about whether they have any thoughts on that. But first, I'm going to come to Kirsty um, because uh, she might have something more to say about that joining up of ethics teams and data teams yeah it's um so we've been running the research data repository with sensitive and controlled data for i think we're on our seventh year and it's our 10th year of re releasing data sets so we've got a bit of experience in it and we've seen how it's changed over that time but the main problem that we have is that um data data teams and ethics teams read consent and participant in information sheets differently and uh, whilst research governance and ethics are very concerned, and rightly so, in the ethics of the research project, they don't look at the finer language and um, compare and contrast a participant information sheet with a consent form. And sometimes the language can become uh, contradictory between the two. And in fact, and sometimes because they're not separating personal information, the administrative data that supports the study and the research data output at the end, it can become quite um, quite difficult to tease out which particular part of uh, data they were talking about and what promises have been made to participants. So whilst I appreciate that there may be uh, less risk than, than we are concerned with, um, I feel that it is my duty to be that backstop for research participants. My background's in social sciences, my PhD's in sociology. So the ethics for me are that I have to make sure that a lay person could have read that and would have been able to understand it and wouldn't have got confused by the language. So we do quite a lot of work at Bristol trying to um, train ethics boards because the turnover is very fast. And, uh, and it's not their prime point of concern when they're looking at an ethics form. So we're doing work to, to train them and we hope to release some kind of training information that will help support that because in our experience of the restricted and controlled data sets, the one snagging point all the time is that consent and participant information sheet. We've probably got a number of data sets which could have been shared as open data had the language been clearer and, um, and now have had to be restricted. But at least that data is out there in some form or another. So that's that's what we're trying to do at Bristol in terms of getting our own institution's house in order, if that makes sense. That's brilliant. And if you do end up producing guidance, I think um, it would be great to share that so yeah. that wider community can make use of that. Obviously, other institutions, I'm sure, will be doing similar things. 
but there'll be some that, that won't be all that would like to and could um, um, get ahead more quickly by by borrowing on the experience of other institutions. I think as well, the, the thing is that we're in a fortunate position because we've got restricted data that we can share it as that if it doesn't come up to scratch for us. In other institutions, that data is then not shared if there are people checking it at the same level. And I appreciate that every institution has got different staffing levels and it will vary, but we're still losing out on data that could be shared properly if those ethics boards um, were able to look at it with a data hat on rather than an ethics hat. Brenda makes the point that they uh, seem to have had a similar experience at Leeds, and um, I'm sure it's an experience that's uh, shared across several institutions. I'm going to come back to Neil's point because, um, and, and I'm going to put this to, um, to my colleagues on the panel. Although we've been talking about research objects generally, much of our conversation in terms of the specifics has focused on data and code largely. Um, but what Neil's point highlights is that there are these other elements of the research process like the, um, the study protocol that you might have, again, in, in context where that's appropriate. To what extent do we have the right infrastructure to share all of the research objects that capture a research process from conception through to the final output? And to what extent is our infrastructure skewed towards certain types of research objects, I guess? I don't know if either of you have a, have a thought on that. In other words, where do we need to grow capacity to be able to cover off these other um, research objects? Um, okay, I was I, I was going to answer a slightly different question. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think I mean I think we can do it. It's it's a, a matter of um, I mean we can we can we can share digital objects. I think it's it's everything that's related to that. It's the metadata and, and the standards and, and agreeing agreeing a, a sector approach to to how we we curate. Um, all of these different objects, but I was actually going to um, talk also about the fact that I think um, yes, ethics applications should be preserved and shared. I think, um, but also the the, um, the study design um, and how the data is going to be collected and, and, and structured. And because for for me, uh, the most important thing is what we should be evaluating in research, and I think we need to move away from the results driven evaluation and actually be evaluating the hypotheses and the approach to how the study is going to be conducted and i think if we have all this sharing in in place and and and, and agreed within within the sector then we could maybe start moving away from from the just um evaluating the output of the res of research but evaluating the research process as a high quality. So. And that's something I very much agree with. If you can focus on getting the process right, then to an extent you can just, you know, trust the outputs to look after themselves. Um, and of course, the registered reports format is one of the ways that's been proposed for shifting that focus away from outputs and onto process, onto the design of a study and the conduct of a study and so on. Um, but the challenge, I guess, is how can we join all of these different elements up? Because you're right, of course, that you can there are, you will find a home for these different research objects. To give the example from our own research group, we tend to put our study protocols on the open science framework, um, but then we eventually put our data and code onto the, um, the institutional repository that we have access to and that Kirsty's spoken about. So they end up in different places and they have DOIs, so you can link them that way, but it's a little bit fragmented. Um, Victoria, you have your hand up. Yeah, and I think there's um, and Adam Bells more is on the call. He's um, doing lots of other things at the moment too. But I think there's the research activity identifier, the kind of envelope persistence that could be deployed here. Um, and I, I welcome Adam um, jumping in if I'm getting any of this wrong. I mean, I guess it's one of those things that have, has to be developed pragmatically and, and incrementally to keep up with the technology, as I say. And also, one of the things that is always in the back of my mind is there's, there's the reducing bureaucracy review. Um, and that's something that I think we have to kind of play through some of this and make sure that what we are curating has onward lessons and onward um, applications and can be used by the many. So I think there's always a temptation to kind of cover everything with everything. And I just would be really interested in people's views as to how we do move this forward really ensure that end-to-end -end ethics 
but actually make sure that what we're not doing is creating an industry that we can't really afford to sustain. But then I would just finally say that there is an EDI dimension to this. If we can expose, as Tamsin says, the entire process, we can make research much more, I guess, um, inclusive and um, talk about uh, language of belonging in research and make it much more of an open um, process in the people and culture terms too. Louise makes a very good point in the um, in the chat that uh, having controlled vocabularies for the range of research outputs will help with distributed storage. And that's a really good point. We have DOIs, but if we can have some um, common vocabularies, linguistic identifiers that can help to knit this stuff together as well, I think that could be um, quite powerful because I don't think we want to centralize everything. I think there's value in having this kind of diversity of, uh, of platforms and approaches. But equally, ultimately, we do need to be able to join everything up to avoid just being in the, lost in a, a sea of research uh, objects, if you like. Um, this is probably a good point to flag the um, Octopus platform, which is something that's been designed with, with STEM disciplines in mind. But the principle of it is that it's a place that effectively deconstructs the traditional journal article into the component parts that reflect the process, very similar to what we've been talking about. And that's a project that is funded by Research England and an initiative that UKRN is supporting. Um, but uh, but that's something that feels like it's um, like in a, it's in a similar space. I'm just seeing whether um, Adam has his hand up, but I don't see that. Um, and Kirsty makes the point that large universities are often siloed within those universities to such an extent that we don't think of what we can do at the beginning to make the whole process more robust, better designed, and uh, and transparent. Oh, Adam, you have put your hand up. Come in. I'm so sorry, I was actually um, working on schema for practice research and at the same time as doing this, which is a terrible thing to multitask <laughs> at this. <laughs> but very relevant. Um, yeah. Well, yes, exactly. Um, so uh, thanks for flagging uh, that to me. So the, um, the thing about connecting all of these um, various discrete elements up and actually Octopus is indeed relevant to this is about um, looking at uh, some of the kind of instance-based persistent identifiers and so on that we have now um, is kind of, well, they're, they're terminal, aren't they? And uh, I use that um, word with um, a, a nuanced pun. Um, and they, they kind of force us to kind of wrap everything up at the kind of the end, right? And they kind of say, here is kind of the final thing. And it in some way gets in the way of like kind of the research process and workflows that we do. Um, and so uh, the RAID identifier that um, Victoria mentioned is a way to kind of look at research activity. Um, specifically, we're kind of focusing on projects as the first implementation in the UK um, and kind of hang all those things together and build that narrative. So this is particularly great for things that don't necessarily have um, textual outputs, the very many things, those objects that Tamsin um, flagged in her talk earlier, and you can, you know, build a narrative because what you do is you attach the research activity um, and you put something that has maybe a DOI or a ROAR for an organization. Uh, you can put all the people together with work, all, the, all these things that we already, you know, have something to describe, um, and you can hang them together with this persistent identifier that allows you to build this kind of overall view um, or narrative because they're time bound as well of uh, a project that um, goes, you know, sometimes we don't always have a project that's at the same institution. It's not always necessarily the same people. Um, you also see, you know, you get this bit of funding here, a bit of funding there. Um, I was a postdoc. I had um, officially seven roles in a year, bit of, you know, bit of cash here and there that very much kind of reflects some of the work that um, I did over that. Um, I think, touching on some of the kind of things that Victoria's saying about EDI and so on, you know, there's things like the credit rules. And again, you know, these things from, first of all, like, you know, STEM point of view, there are other um, rule taxonomies. So there's the things like that built into um, Haplo and Symplectic and other systems like that, or there's the 467 million built into Pure, um, which allow you to you know, pick and choose uh, a way to reflect kind of the contributions. And I know, um, Lizzie Gad put up a thing saying, how do we make sure that these things are themselves equitable and fair and whether or not some rules are valued more than others. And I think, again, that's about looking at how these things are part of 
the reflection of the research effort itself. And I think that's um, something that we could really, as a community, look to um, discussing as we put them into our systems. Um, and I think, yeah, that's a really valuable discussion to have as we go forward to build these things in to ensure they're reflecting our community and, you know, that openness and fairness that we put into our metadata reflects what we're actually trying to capture as well. So, yeah, so hang stuff together, use RAID, make sure that we're reflecting our practices, use things like um, fair data that has rules and stuff reflected inside it, for example, credit. Thank you. That's really helpful, Adam. And Helen has helpfully put the RAID link into the chat as well, if people want to um, look at that. Um, and I think this, you know, this reflects the need for that joining up to also include bringing together all of the different communities that are on this call, researchers, library teams, and so on, um, when it comes to thinking about how to do this and, and what training needs to be in place and uh, what the standards need to be uh, that we adopt across the piece. There's, um, this makes me think of one higher level question, which is to what extent does this conversation lead to another conversation about what we think the version of record should be? At the moment, we treat the final research output, the journal article, say, as the version of record. But actually, what we're talking about is the need to um, capture the research process more than focus on the research output. So do we need to have a dimension to this conversation which is about what the future of journals is for example and whether or not we need to move away from this idea of a sort of potted summary being the definitive um snapshot of a piece of research and more towards just treating the elements that capture the process as being the the, the fundamentals i don't know if either victoria or tamsin you have any thoughts on that it's quite a big question i guess Victoria. I'm not I'm not going to be able to give a comprehensive answer, but it's something that um, has come up in our um, discussion, actually, with our group of Provost Chancellors for Research from across the UK. And they're interested in us holding an alternative publishing workshop to really push the boundaries and look at what this might look like. And my colleague, Karina Weiger, I don't think she's on the call, is organising that. So um, it will be something that we're hoping to sort of convene views on and some sort of publications on looking at what that might be. Um, so, yeah, I think it's something that's hugely important. You know, what are we actually counting? Um, and I know that it's something that, oh, sorry, Tamsin, come in. Well, well all I was, was going to say is kind of what Victoria uh, alluded to at the end is while while research is evaluated, evaluated on the final output, then that's where the focus is going to lie. So I think uh, research evaluation and, and what happens next is 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 quite critical in in, in how we reframe. I think that's right. And, and Neil puts into the chat a nice uh, phrase that rather than thinking about the version of record, we should be thinking about the record of versions. And I think that's partly the point that, you know, that idea that you capture an output in a journal article creates a very static model of, um, of research activity, whereas, in fact, the reality is uh, is much more dynamic than that. Um, Victoria, you've got your hand up again. Just a quick one, Brenda's question, and then um, Kirsty's response about um, Risha. So the UK Data Archives um, facility for funded research projects by the ESRC. And I don't know the full detail of this because I'm not particularly close to it, but I think most do have a, a record in there. Not all the outputs may go in there because it might be that they're not um, appropriate or they're not relevant for this particular um, model. So I think there are issues of technology again. Um, it may be that we do need to go back to our conversation about what are the technologies we need to underpin some of this to make it easier, to make it, um, I guess, more concertina rather than a huge issue of everything. So yeah, I think just just go over to Risha and you'll find out all the policies of that on there. But yeah, it's absolutely a useful resource. And yeah, that was all Marcus on that one. Thanks. That's uh, that's really helpful. We've only got a few minutes left, so I'll see if there are any more questions, if anyone wants to pop their hand up. I think this question of um, how we move away from a model of scientific communication that's based on the journal article, for example, or on the book or on the monograph, obviously there are different um, modes of output. But that, that fundamental model of dissemination is, is pretty antiquated now and doesn't capture well the, the dynamic nature of research activity. So um, this is part of a much bigger conversation around what future academic research activity could look like. 
but again that brings challenges in terms of a making sure that everyone is working in a in an interoperable way and b that we're able to actually make sense of that that mass of different research objects that will end up uh, proliferating if we if we go down this route which i'm sure we will and which we need to do well well we are close enough to the end of our time that i think uh, we may um draw things to a close i'll just wait to see if any hands pop up or if any more questions come into the chat but i'm not seeing any this has been a really uh, rich and interesting conversation we've covered loads of ground there's been a great deal of uh, activity in the chat and conversations happening within that alongside uh, the contributions from um, my colleagues on the panel so thank you again uh, louise tamsin and victoria for your time i really appreciate it thank you all for joining us a uh, particular thanks to um, Will, the UKRN administrator, who sets all of this up and makes sure that everything runs smoothly. And without him, these things wouldn't uh, wouldn't happen at all. Um, I, so thank you again. Um, do come along to more of these um, workshops. That, that we have them on a, a range of different topics, and you can find out what's coming up next on our website. And um, I'm sure that all of the speakers would be happy to field questions individually if you if you want to contact them um, after the workshop. And uh, this was recorded, so there will be a version of this that you can come back to if you want to dip into any elements of it again. So enjoy the rest of your afternoons, and uh, thank you again for joining us. Bye-bye.